What is up, everybody? It's Dr. Vibe here, host and producer of the award-winning Dr. Vibe show, the home of Epic Conversations. And I'm the host of Epic Conversations 2020 Best Podcast News in 2018, Innovation Award winner given out by the Canadian Ethnic Media Association. Also, I host the only online show in the world for fathers and dads. This is sponsored by Da Dove. Sorry, I gotta get that right. By Dove Men Care and Dad Central. Dad Central is Canada's national food, national fatherhood organization. And also, I am the board chair of the Global Food and Drink Initiative, which is a multimedia not-for-profit that's based in the United States, whose mission is to show Blacks in the diaspora that are doing all things in food, wine, and travel. As always, I like to say you're blessed, highly favored, a magnet for miracles, and a solution for someone's problem. And it is Black Canada talking time. So once a month. We do, it's actually the last Sunday of each month, we do Black Canada talking where we get Black Canadians. We either showcase them or we get their POVs on things that are going on in their world. Hey, we got the bottom of a live online event that provides Black Canadians an opportunity to give their takes and POVs on stories that are of importance to them. And it's our end of month panel time. And we have uh, two regulars and a special guest panelist today. So I'm going to introduce... First up, our regulars. First off, from the East, Miss L. Jones. What's going on, L? Hey, well, you know, we just got COVID after not having any COVID. So oh. just went into lockdown and everybody's enraged. So just we, now? Well, we didn't have anything really since the first wave, right? Like, so oh my gosh. cool. And since like May last year. And we had a little spike before Christmas. And then people came from Ontario and didn't isolate. And spread COVID. So we just went into a lockdown. So everybody's really mad here. But you know, other than that, things are good. Well, I guess I guess my trip for the future on East is not going to be received so nicely. So we were opening up, it was all good. And now we're community spread and we're like as many cases as we've ever had in the whole time. So and how how long is this for? Well we're gonna have four weeks to the 20th. Oh my gosh. I'm sorry. I mean I was in the schools like so we went from like no cases to like 44 cases like overnight. And then like, you know, we just keep going. So but you're okay. Yeah, Otherwise. I know. I don't go outside. I'm <laughs> all right. All right. As long as you're safe, that's the most important thing. And I know you you know a good chef, but that's another conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Next up, we got our dear friend Cesar. What is up, Cesar? Brothers, sisters. Hi, everyone. Pleasure to be here as always. Um, lots of things going on, of oh, course. Yeah. So many things to talk about, as always, regarding uh, the reality of being black, black in a black body, black in so many intersections, gender, but also anything and everything. That's why we're here, Pan Africanism, all the way. Good stuff. And you're safe and okay? I'm okay. I'm still alive. Thanks, the ancestors. Another day. And, you know, when we think about the passing of so many of our. Uh, Musical legends that we grew up yeah. with, DMX, Black Rob. I don't want to say too much on that, but respect and tributes to the families and also to all the activists, men, women, LGBTQ, of our people who are standing and doing the fight every day, but too often go uh, unknown or ignored. Respect. Good to have you here as always. always. And our special guest today from Ottawa, Sarah Ayongo. Sarah, where are you? There she is. Bonjour. How are bonjour, you? Bonjour. No, I'm not in Ottawa. Je ne suis pas à Ottawa. I greet you from the um, unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin people, but on the Quebec side in Gatineau, Gatineau, ah. Quebec. So in Quebec, we also are in some sort of lockdown and we've been under curfew forever, it feels like, because we, we can't be seen outside past 8 p.m., I believe. They had, they had made it later and then when they saw people were abusing it, they you know went back to the original. And I, I think people saw the protests in uh, Quebec City, mm -hmm. in my province, where they went to the old uh, port and proceeded to basically try and uh, destroy and vandalize uh, a whole bunch of small businesses that were already struggling. And uh, I have to tell you, uh, uh, the people here don't just, they do not take well to being told what to do in the first place. 
and then being put under curfew and lockdown. So, and the cases, yes, they've gone up as well um, yeah. here. And we're the uh, the community spread, and I think maybe Nova Scotia is the same thing. It's being fueled by these new variants of uh, concern. So, okay. but I'm safe and I'm Good. well. Merci Good. beaucoup. Uh, you, you are not a regular with us, so if you can Well, take... I'm a regular listener. Yes, like, that's true. So you're pro <laughs> you've, yeah, and you've been on live a few times. And you, but if you can take like 60 seconds to just give a little background on yourself for our viewers, because for many, they don't know the good person oh. that you are. Oh, okay. Um, I'm a uh, community radio and television host. Uh, but most of my community media work is in radio with CHUO 89.1 FM in Ottawa, where you can hear myself and my co-hosts, Adrian, Denise, and Patricia, and Jacqueline, every Saturday from 11 a.m. to noon, talking about different issues, including COVID and the mm. budget mm -hmm. and policing and all kinds of uh, uh, shows like that. I also host two other African shows, one in French and the other in English. And the TV show is on Rogers, Rogers, Ottawa. And uh, yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. Well done. Great intro. Great intro. Looking forward to another epic conversation today. And uh, we're going to start off with a budget. The, the federal budget was released earlier on in the week. And uh, a very interesting document. Uh, money seems to be going out all over the place, especially to the black community. And I wonder why it is, but let's, uh, Sarah has a little bit of a, yeah. a, a good case on, on the budget. So Sarah, we're going to let you lead on the conversation. Yeah. I have an unfair advantage because uh, I happen to work for a media organization that uh, specializes in parliamentary affairs and politics, etc. So I have no choice but to follow this <laughs> stuff. So basically, it, um, the budget was um, tabled on the 19th and uh, by the first ever female uh, Minister of Finance. So, you know, a little history being made there. And um, a budget that had a feminist uh, bent to it. And we're going to talk about, you know, the commitment to childcare that is in uh, that budget, $30 billion for that. Uh, but uh, again, interesting to note that once again, uh, investments were made to address uh, issues that are critical to Black Canadians and uh, where we live. So uh, investments uh, to support Black community, Black community support programs, uh, data, uh, race-based data collection, public service uh, recruitment, that's not so much money as it is uh, amending the Public Service uh, Act, mental health supports, black entrepreneurialism, uh, and we're gonna, I'm sure, have something to say about the uh, black uh, endowment fund that uh, is also in the budget. And um, I'd like to really salute all of the Black-led organizations and advocates, there were over 200 Black-led organizations uh, whose efforts and uh, participation in uh, pre-budget consultations led to some of the me measures that uh, are included in this budget. Okay. So thank you so much for the overview of the budget. Uh, Responses, any initial reaction from L or Cesar? I, I have a few thoughts, but I'd definitely like my co-panelists or the panelists to ask any questions because it seems that Sarah's more at first. And I know a little bit I was involved in the pre-budget consultations myself too. So L, Cesar, what are your initial comments or thoughts, if any, when it comes to this budget? Well, first of all, thank you so much, Sarah, for breaking this down for us um, because I mean, I followed a little bit, but it, you know, it's very complex. So I really am like really glad that there's black people out here that are specifically pulling out what's relevant to the black community because otherwise we have to go through this all ourselves. So thank you so much. That's why it's really important to have black voices in the media. I actually didn't know some of that that you were telling me. Um, one of the pieces that stood out to me is more money for drug courts. 
which may sound good, but is concerning um, because at the same time, Canada has been sort of undergoing a process to rethink our drug laws. And this is related to something we're gonna be talking about later, which is of course the George Floyd, um, the, de the verdict for Derek Chauvin. And I think it's really important that we think about George's George Floyd's case in the context of the war on drugs as well, right? That like um, the whole defense case was basically like he was on drugs, he died because of drugs, and essentially he deserved to die because he was on drugs. So this long war on drugs that also creates stigma against drug users. Canada has slowly been trying to dismantle some of this. Um, so Bill C-22, right, where we decriminalize simple possession, but we maintained a lot of penalties. And so there was a lot of pushback on that. Um, and then now we have expanded money for drug courts, which suggests, in other words, that we're going to keep criminalizing drug use. Like drug use is a medical issue and it shouldn't be in the courts, period. And the problem with drug courts is that it still creates a penalty. And then if you like relapse or, you know, you, you something happens, you end up with actually more penalties. First, you've gone through drug court and had to go through all of that. Then you end up breaching your drug court conditions and you end up with like more charges. And it's worse than if you'd just gone to jail in the first place. So we really don't want any kind of compelled treatment. Um, for people who are using drugs, we want people to obviously voluntarily go into treatment if that's something they want and need. Um, so that's concerning, just seeing that money go. It like looks good on the surface, so it's something that people are like, okay, good, we're trying to move people out of the criminal justice system, but we can't just make a medical system that becomes a criminal system. Like a medical system has to be a medical system based on best practice. It can't be a criminal system. So that's just something that stood out to me. Um, the other thing I want to talk about isn't directly to the budget. And I hope, Sarah, you come back in and give us some of the more technicalities because this is actually really helpful. Um, but there's been a sort of broader conversation going on in the Black community about money. So um, BLM has been in that conversation, right? There was a um, sort of what has happened to the money with BLM Global Network. So not the individual chapters, not the general people that make up a mass movement, but specifically some of that leadership. And I don't want to get into that. Some of it's being fueled by the right wing. Some of it's obviously coming from Black people who have been launching critique for a long time. But what it raised for us is, I think, a really important question around just ethics and money and how do we be transparent with the community and what does accountability look like from Black organizations and people. And that's a conversation that's been really difficult to have in the Black community historically and always gets kind of co-opt like again with the BLM conversation it originated with chapters that are trying to have that conversation and of course it gets co-opted by white people who then it becomes like who has this house or you know what it isn't really the conversation which is around when we have money you know how do we equitably distribute it what are the ethics and principles behind that um the broader question is you know what does it look like in this time if you're making money from this movement you know what do you owe back to your community um and those are really important questions so I think it's just interesting that we've been involved in a kind of broader conversation about what finances mean in the black community, how we manage that, what happens when we get our hands on money um, that may be also related to this conversation about the budget. Like, what does it mean when we're giving money to black, which is like never any money. Like I never want to buy into this idea that like the, oh no, 200 million. I always say these are rounding errors on reports. Like the government spends more to decide if they should shift garbage date than like they give black people to sustain our entire lives across Canada. But even with that, we've seen, you know, all the issues around who's black to get money and like what that looks like. So I just think that's an interesting conversation as well. Right. Like what are the ethics of money, community money and collective money in the black community? And that's what I'll say. And Cesar, but I also, Sarah, I hope you can jump back in and give us some more particulars, because that, like I said, that's been really helpful. Cesar. So. Um, <laughs> thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Al. Um, all right, let's get controversial. Some of the criticism that has come regarding the federal budget is that it's an electoralist budget. Um, there's a historical lens. Uh, Minister and Deputy Prime Minister Chrystia Freeland announcing it. You know, some people talk about a feminist budget, notably in terms of millions in five years to come regarding daycare. I welcome that. But it's an electoralist budget because it seems like, uh, in pers I mean, it seems at first glance like a lot of gifts to uh, minority communities and notably black. Um, I welcome it. I welcome it considering all the pain and harm that not only COVID has created, but also the economic recession that we're in. In terms of the questions that come in terms of the potential management, the potential management of uh, money, um, this is really a conversation that in terms of black community, we must keep improving. Uh, we already had that conversation, not to be regarding black chamber of commerce, 
regarding even uh, other organizations that as black people, we are too often aware of how public funds tend to come into organizations and too often they don't get redistributed. They don't get to be seen by the average black person and too many uh, by nepotism use organizations to uh, uh, enlarge the bank accounts for some uh, offshore slash interest back home in Africa and the Caribbean. However, in terms of all the pain that has come, at least since 2020, and notably with COVID, social determinants of health, I mean, this budget in terms of trying to address black entrepreneurship, I believe up to 200 millions, but also social activities and community organizations. And I must say, I think we have to, I don't want to say celebrate because I don't think it should be something to celebrate. It's something that should be a bare minimum, but at least recognition of a minimum $15 wage a day, which of course, if you ask me, it's not enough, but it's better than what was prior. Uh, if I can quickly address the issue regarding uh, uh, the criminalization of drugs and regarding black people, we must always be honest in recognizing that this is a colonial land and by default, it's also a racist country. Let's be careful. Absolutely one of the best countries to live in, but systemic racism is uh, very much alive where to the point the prime minister recognizes it. And as such, when it comes to drugs and being black, we basically live in a Canadian society, also the US and pretty much worldwide, where a white person with a drug issue is seen as a medical problem, example, uh, opioids. A black person, uh, as minimal as it is, let's say even marijuana, is seen as a criminal, and we saw it so well, to give reference to uh, the Derek Chauvin uh, trial, where the defense bluntly put it that they were in, intending on sowing doubt regarding uh, 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 Brother Floyd drug use, despite all the medical experts uh, clearly attesting that it wasn't the case. It's really a matter of culture, it's a matter of societal conversation. Too often, it's not a matter of facts. It's not a matter of science, and it's not a matter of well-being for each and everyone. So we must address this. But regarding the federal budget, it's better than anything. And if I can just one last thing, a lot of criticism must always be addressed when there is a budget. But we must always be fair. I find hilarious to have the conservative leader, Erin O'Toole, criticizing a federal budget when as a black person, he doesn't even recognize systemic racism and too many black conservatives tend to be quiet next to Massa when he <laughs> basically doesn't even recognize systemic racism, AKA he doesn't even recognize the indignity to the black skin and the skin of the family, friends and other black people in Canada. I'm sorry, Erin O'Toole has no word to say regarding criticism of the budget for Blacks and notably Indigenous and others. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to stay away from, you know, the whole partisan thing. And get right back <laughs> I, I'm not a liberal. Budget. I'm not a liberal. I just find it funny that he I, had that criticism. That's not what I, yeah, yeah, no, that's not what I meant. But oh, anyway, um, yes, indeed, the $30 billion commitment to child care is going to be very helpful to our black, mostly single moms, sometimes having to work several jobs and uh, living in poverty despite the several jobs because they just, they cannot afford uh, upper quality childcare. The, the problem though, you already, you, 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 well, okay. So this is to fund a national childcare program outside Quebec because my province, We've had a subsidized uh, provincial wide childcare problem, okay? And the whole baby bonus and the whole thing. There have been measures for years to support families and having children. But the government, the federal government is gonna have to um, <laughs> negotiate with all the different provinces, provinces. you know, to, to put that in place. And if we go by what happened with carbon tax, Bonjour la visite, okay? Like it's it's not, we may not even see it uh, before uh, a whole other term of the liberal, this current liberal government, if, if it survives. 
Um, one uh, thing I really want to bring up is that really piqued my interest is this $200 million in 2021-22 uh, that is being given to Employment and Social uh, Development Canada to establish this Black-led philanthropic endowment uh, fund, uh, which is going to in turn finance initiatives by local Black community organizations to address things like, you know, fighting uh, anti-Black racism, and just improving the, the social and economic outcomes of the different communities. And like Elle said, we really don't have the greatest record in terms of you know, the financial accountability piece uh, when you know, money like that is, is, uh, is given out. And I mean, I, I'm, you know, I'm a board member of a nonprofit and I know for a fact, we, we have often had to say, Nah, we're not even going to try and apply for that because look at the 10 pages of requirements, mm -hmm. reporting requirements we have to do, one, two. That's a lot of money for our little organization to try. Matt, we have to hire a whole other body just to be keeping track of this money. We No, we can't, you know, that sort of thing. So it's all well and good for them to, to throw that money out. But if mm -hmm. we don't have organizations that have the capacity, the wherewithal, the expertise, uh, and the trust, and the trust of the communities they're supposed to serve, we will be going nowhere fast. And next thing you know, money will be returned to the Treasury Board of Canada. And then the government is going to say, see, look at these Black people. We had all this money earmarked. We had the, the public security money. Uh, I saw something, yes, the, the, the money to enhance, um, what is it, communities at risk security infrastructure program. And that's to, uh, to work on the security systems of, you know, like places of worship and community centers that are likely to be targeted by racists, you know, vandalism, destruction, et cetera. So yeah, you know, that's the first thing I thought when I, I saw all these amounts flying all over the place is, okay, A, who's going to be managing that money? How are they gonna be able to manage it? And where are we going to see the, the accountability? I'm not saying we can't do it. I mean, we have organizations like the BBPA and the, the you know, the Black North Initiative and, Taibu and you know all kinds of different organizations that do effective work with the funding they get. But I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to jump in for a quick second here. I think there's a, a few things, and I think it's another conversation about the whole funding process. Yes, there's and there needs to be accountability on the receiver's end, but also on the giver's end. You know, I spent most of last year listening to, and and Sarah was in a number of these conversations with a number of black nonprofit, I will say legitimate organizations that are not being set up for success by the federal government for whatever reason. A lot of times it's processes. A lot of times they have to spend money that they don't have to get the money that they should get. And then you and, get the money late. That happens well, to us all the time. We right. passed when we needed it. Because it takes, I don't know, seven months or something. Exactly. To process, you know, I don't know, 20 pages. So when I hear announcements of money, as we before we went live, I said, hashtag get the bag. Right? Get the bag. Right. And for me, I, I I'm just looking back because I there's 221 million. Where is it? There's 25 million. Where is it? So now it it's I think. I think what may need to happen is we need to make a list of all the promised monies. And the, and the concerning part is, even if those monies were given out, A, the process needs to be improved. B, organizations that should get aren't getting. So this is a mess. And in some minds, ways, my mind is saying, you're throwing money to make a, a problem worse than it is. And I, I would rather consultations happen with all the parties to get this process right 
than just throwing this thing. And at the end of the day, the people that really need the help aren't getting the help. So I Cesar first, then back to Sarah. Cesar, go ahead. I just very quickly wanted to uh, state that you noticed that I spoke some may think naively, not naively. I spoke positively of the budget regarding black populations, but as we are envisaging, uh, looking forward to potential issues, we already had an issue that, to my knowledge, is still not fully settled, AKA some of these black organizations that were being questioned in terms of, are they really black? Yes. <laughs> so, that's, see, that's as a... we are looking at more influx of money beautiful promises bring the elections in summer or september we know which party black most of the black uh, community will vote for but did we get an apology did we really get fixes did some of those organizations that got slighted aka insulted regarding the racial belonging to a black uh, to the black community such as somalis did they get any kind of compensation I mean, we need, are we really having these conversations or really just like, you know, forget that controversy from a few months ago? Look what we're promising to you, aka white savior complex dangling a bunch of millions that may just bring more complications, especially in terms of returns, loans. You see all of these type of things. And then, of course, interests. I mean, <laughs> I'm saying, you know, what, what do I know? <laughs> Sarah Head, go ahead, Sarah. Um, I think also what needs to happen is within our own Black community, we need to also do a better job of information sharing because we're finding out here in, in, in Ottawa and in Quebec that a lot of the organizations that are not being helped or, you know, get left behind, it's often because they don't get the information. The information is not filtering out from the gatekeepers of the information, the, the people who, who know Ahmed Hussein and who hang out with um, Greg Fergus, my member of parliament, or you know who know the Michael Jean Foundation people or know the BNI people, et cetera, et cetera. So all the different associations like national associations and uh, associations that work in the settlement sector, for example, or you know the ones that cater to uh, young people, um, you know, young mothers, single mothers, like, y'all need to like, you know, share the information. This keeping it to yourself for what? It, it helps nobody. It doesn't help you, right? So that's also what we need to do because the government puts it out there and they, they slap that on their Canada.ca website, black this, black that, black whatever. <sighs> but that doesn't mean anything if you didn't go to, you know, Dr. Vibe, the pre-budget budget consultation uh, meetings and the post-budget consultations meeting that we've been attending. So I have an interesting question for you, sir. You're located in the capital region. Yes. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, when they are announcing a budget, is it not tradition that they have media in to give them an advance look at the budget? Yeah, but the thing is, you know, it's in lockup. So that, here's, my, here's my question. Yeah. Were there or have there ever been black journalists invited to that? Ha! There we go. There <laughs> we go. Listen, no, no, listen. I've I've been with this media organization for over 20 years. Yeah. And I've been in the physical lockup because this year for the first time it was virtual. So you didn't yeah. really know who was yeah. what, right? Um, and yeah, you know, most years it was like oh, I'm the one black person and I'm a translator. I'm not even a reporter. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Never mind black media people, black media organizations mm -hmm. and South Asian media organizations mm -hmm. and anything that's non-mainstream, non-white media organization. That's one thing you have to say for prime, former Prime Minister Harper. Because if you look at you know a lot of his... Um, press conferences, especially towards, you know, the end, you always, always, always had, you know, the South Asian in there, the Black in there, the Chinese in there, asking at least one question. 
And the mainstream did not like it. The gatekeepers of this access mm -hmm. absolutely did not like it because, oh my God, these people were asking questions that were relevant to their communities. Mm -hmm. You know, immigration issues, uh, you know, uh, policing issues, right. you know, health issues that affect their community, discrimination, et cetera, et cetera. So you are absolutely correct. I mean, so were you the only black person in the media lockup last week? I don't know. It was virtual. And because I'm not a reporter, I'm a translator. So yeah. all I care about is what does it say and what do I have to translate? Garbage right. in, garbage out, garbage in, garbage right. out. Like I'm not even, and I'm not allowed to let any of it out until the Minister of Finance is standing up yeah. in the House of Commons, reading this out. And this is done for a specific reason. And there's a reason it's at four o'clock. It's the, because the, the 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 stock market has closed by that. Yes, yes. So yeah. it's so that people can't use the information they know ahead of time to go and, you know, do all these transactions that enrich themselves. Which, and, which and has never friends. happened. Of course, that's never <laughs> happened. Right? <laughs> So, 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 see, to me, if, yeah, if they should have, if, if they can't, if the government cares about Canadians, you should have black representation at those lockups. Yeah. And you know what? Uh, I'm putting this call out to the Canadian Associ Association of Black Journalists, CABJ. Yep. Yeah. CABJ has now an excellent leadership. They're, they seem, you know, much more active and proactive Nadine, yeah, Nadine this Stewart. is something they because they advocate so this is something they should advocate for and a lot of the people who run that organization are current or former broadcast journalists who know exactly what you're talking about okay. so you know that would be something they could take on okay Elle, anything you're wanting to add before we probably move to another yeah, our I'm second conversation into the next conversation because i i think sarah's point also around um, information sharing and gatekeeping is a really important one. And it takes us into something about this moment, right? Because it's not just with the budget that black people are finally getting, you know, some forms of look in. It's like universities, everybody's committed to 12 hires, 18 hires, all these big hires coming in. I'm like, where are you going to get the black people from? You know, but then uh, like so you kicked us all out years ago, you know, you wouldn't give us PhDs, you wouldn't give us jobs. Everybody left to go do other things. And now you want black academics. And this is what Cesar said as well, right? It's actually a really sort of painful gaslight of this moment that for so many years, it's not like black people haven't been around doing things, qualifying for things. And they never wanted us. We were garbage and worthless. And now suddenly in this moment, because of PR, not because our lives matter more, suddenly this group and that group and this institution, everybody wants black people. And they never come and say, you know, I'm really sorry that five years ago I rejected your resume and you were qualified and now come back in and here's some reparations, right? Like that doesn't happen. They're just like, oh yeah, now we're hiring people. I'm like, what about all the people you threw in the garbage can? <laughs> like, why don't you go back to those people that never made your shortlist, that got their resumes thrown out, that never got the grants? So um, but then there's that bigger thing of the way that it forces us into competition with each other, right? So mm -hmm. if it's like a black hire, then you're suddenly competing against all these other black people. And yeah, there's this like, do you like want to get yours? So do you hoard that to yourself and try not tell people? Or do you like, which is the better way, obviously, act collectively, inform each other, try and get everybody in. But it, like, and like one of the dangers is that when we're given these crumbs and this money and that money, and we have to do it against each other, it forces us into competition with each other and actually can become a huge divide and rule, right? Like who who got this money? I didn't get that money. Okay, so my media organization matters because I got government money and I didn't. So, you know, like, and then who has access? So yeah, another question that I think as a community, we have to sort of think about too, right? Like how do we act collectively in the face of, um, you know, the pressures now that like, if you get yours in this sort of two year window that we're going to have, like, do you scramble for yours or do we try and, you know, do it for the whole community? Right? Well, forget the two year window because an election's coming. So Hello. yeah, exactly. so, so, so that's another thing too, an election's coming. So whatever time frame this money was scheduled to come, who, and I'm, I, I'm just saying, and this happens over and over again, when is it going to come? And a mind, this is my question to all of us, what have we learned during this last year about us? And are we willing to do better? And it's because, every, because it's the game is the same. We have to change. 
the, one game the, is, the game is still the same. We're, we we need to play chess, not checkers. And what I'm being with them. No, I didn't mean to keep you interrupting. Sorry, you, you speak more than me, Tony. So pause. I thought you were done. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Um, I don't pause, <laughs> so I'm confused. It's okay. Who pause when they sleep? Um, no, uh, I was going to say that this is something to move into the George Floyd verdict. Is yeah. So many white people in particular have tried to treat that verdict like, okay, so now the system showed that it can like be good. So good, we don't need to like do all these major changes. All we need to do is command like that's one conviction. Uh, and I saw so much rhetoric coming from particularly yeah, white people, like ostensibly liberal rhetoric. I don't mean liberal government. I mean like liberal as in like Martin Luther King, white liberals. Um, that, you know, are like, oh, I'm so relieved because like now we won't have to have this writing because now, you know, like, Black people got what they wanted, so therefore the system works. And I have this like rant about how that I've had for years about how have you noticed that like every black movie until very recently is a takes place in the courtroom. So it's like uh, <laughs> Avastad is a courtroom movie, Mississippi Burning courtroom movie, To Kill a Mockingbird courtroom movie. And there's a reason for that because the idea is sure the system screws you black people, but the system is also it just has some flaws. And if you just engage in the system, the system will save you. And court represents that, right? So so many of the movies about black life have been set in the courtroom. In other words, to say the system may fail you, but then it corrects itself. So don't worry going outside the system. And we've been going outside the system, particularly for the last year, where you have a mass of black people saying this system isn't working for us and we need major changes, not just some money sprinkled, not a couple of reforms. We want some kind of uprooting. And like how we believe in that is obviously a range. You have, you know, full abolitionists and you have people that aren't. But, you know, like as a whole, I would say most people in the black community, we don't agree on what that looks like, but we agree that something needs to change, you know, in more profound ways. And so what I've really seen from the Chauvin verdict is so many people trying to take that as like, oh good, the job's done. Like, it's like, that's one verdict. Like that's the first cop like ever <laughs> to be convicted of murder. You know, like literally in Minneapolis, it's the first cop. And like, I mean, at, like, normally even when they get convicted, like what did um, the Quan McDonald's killer get six years? You know, like they're not even giving them the hundred years that you get as black youth, you know, for stealing candy or whatever. Um, so yeah, I also find it really interesting how they've tried to make this verdict, even though the whole movement was black people basically being like, we need to burn it down. They've tried to flip that to be like, oh no, we can preserve the system. Don't worry, black people, you can still use our system. So that's, I, I think, a sort of final indignity that's that's happened in this case, you know? Even before we got the verdict, Sarah, from a black person's perspective and a black media person's perspective, what did you think about the trial? Media coverage wise, and if you can take off a non media hat, <laughs> if you can, <laughs> in regards to that. Also, after that, I like Cesar's, uh, Cesar's opinion on or thoughts on the trial itself before the verdict was put out. Um, <clears throat> so I, I noticed that there seemed to be a very sort of careful attempt at humanizing George Floyd. Because as you saw in, in, in the court, all the only game the defense had was to dehumanize and pathologize this man, human being. Oh, he had drugs. Oh, he would he had already had run-ins. Oh, this, oh, that, you know. And uh, the media not except Fox News, AON, and all of those um, you know. Extreme right. droit, no? uh, the, yeah, right the right, media. yeah, it, the right, yeah. Everybody else was being really careful to um, humanize him, and you know, I find it helps in the United States that uh, over the last twenty years, there's sort of been a, a, a rise in prominence of black commentators. You know, Mark Lamont Hill. You know, uh, Joy Reid who actually a whole bunch of them who have their own shows on cable news network and who are on all day, on the weekend, all the time, everywhere. So that there's that counter narrative that's going on at the same time as whatever's going on in the mainstream. So I found that there seemed to be a very careful, deliberate attempt uh, to humanize him. And uh, I have to, I you know, I'm going to admit, I watch MSNBC all the time. 
uh, because I want information. <laughs> I, I, I just, I don't want just propaganda, you know, I want actual information. And um, it's interesting how they, um, they were showing the difference between what happened with Breonna Taylor and what happened in this case, uh, notwithstanding the fact that George's uh, murder was actually filmed and was on TV constantly for a while. The attorneys general, two black attorneys general, but two different outcomes. And right in my head, like I kept thinking Daniel Cameron, uh, Keith Ellison, Daniel Cameron. <laughs> It's not just representation that matters. It doesn't matter if it's a black guy that's there. That's the police chief. That's the attorney general. That's the prosecutor. That's a, no. If that person is not intent on actually applying true justice, like Daniel Cameron was not in Kentucky, you're not getting justice. So it, it's like a t in my head all the time, it was like a tale of two two situations going out at the same time. I have to say though, I, I was relieved. I wasn't elated or celebratory. I was relieved. I have I have family in Minneapolis. They went through last summer. They went, I bought this t-shirt in Minneapolis mm -hmm. a year after the Michael Brown thing happened. And I didn't want them to have to now go through this whole thing again with the, you know, the vandalism and the violence and all of that stuff. So I was, really nervous, but like L, I don't think that, you know, it's system wide. And the president and vice president rightly said, no, this is one case. There needs to be a system wide sort of, you know, re reviewing of what's going on. And I'm glad to see that they've decided to start with the Minneapolis police department when it comes to examining police practices. Cesar. <laughs> You're laughing again. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. I had not thought of the I had not thought of the Brianna Taylor and George Floyd at the same time in terms of contrast, but I love what you said about Daniel Cameron and you know as a Pan-Africanist, let us never forget that our heroes, our leaders, our women on the battlefield. Uh, the fathers of independence of African countries and so many Caribbean leaders and Black American Afro-Brazilian leaders were betrayed by whom? Their own people. People. Mm -hmm. Not all skin folk are king folk. Daniel Cameron in aiming to be, uh, hoping to become a Supreme Court George, a judge, being a Black MAGA, of course, he sided with the white conservatives. But it's not about him. Uh, this is about George Floyd, but George Floyd, as so was said, is the tree that hides a far bigger forest, a forest of so many names where we say, say his name, say her name, and by his and her, there are so many black children, black seniors that we must not forget. It's a story uh, in America where we can go all the way back to Emmett Till in 1955, and before that, never forget that if my, if my recollection is accurate, between 1877, so right after the Civil War era and Black Reconstruction and political participation in the South, from 1877 to 1950, over 4,000 Blacks were lynched, aka beat, castrated, burned, hanged, over 4,000 Black people. And before that, much, much more. Really, since 1619, legally here, but really it's a story of slavery, colonization, segregation, systemic racism from Canada, yes, Canada as well, all the way to Brazil, and of course, Africa, Oceania, etc. So what I would really say regarding the trial, I mean, <laughs> the cards were visible from the start. We basically had a prosecution that had a recorded murder on tape for all to see. And we had a defense that very bluntly intended to so doubt in terms of the action of a white male cop versus pathologizing, criminalizing 
a black man, AKA making him pass as uh, a drug user. And as we're saying, we were talking about the accountability of our own black people. I hate to say her name, but the Candace Owens of the black community are nothing else but the black skin white mask. And when I say white mask, I mean a white KKK hood, agents of white supremacists in the black community will further participate in dehumanizing the George Floyd, the Breonna Taylor, the Sandra Bland, the Trevor Martin, etc. Everything was plain and clear. Excellent job for the prosecution. They had professional, uh, Dr. Tobin, the pulmonologist, but also uh, Dr. Baker, uh, the, the doctor who basically conducted, conducted the first autopsy. And beyond, of course, uh, George Floyd's um, uh, girlfriend, but also, uh, you know, the witnesses, the tears, the humanity. There's something I'd like for us to always remember. Um, George Floyd's girlfriend, if I'm correct, um, I'm trying to make this connection here that I believe I read. George Floyd's girlfriend was... Um, I believe she was Deontay Wright teacher, or she had been Deontay Wright's teacher. And let us go back to 1955, where Emmett Till murdered, and decades later, the woman, the white woman, one of those original Karen, who lied regarding uh, what she went through. She was still free, but Emmett Till, his death, inspired notably the civil rights movement and a certain Rosa Parks. Yes, it was a range and everything one, but it really inspired them to say enough is enough. We are not going to the back of the bus. Ultimately, George Floyd, the trial, the direct Chauvin trial. Derek Chauvin is just one supremacist, racist, murderous white cop among so many others. And let's not forget, Every day in the USA, at least three people get killed, and we can bet at least one of them is a black person. People have been killed during the George Floyd trial, and ever since, we have that white woman, Kim Porter, who shot the anti right, claiming she confused with the taser. Let's not forget this police brutality somehow doesn't seem to occur to uh, Jewish minorities, to uh, Chinese, Asian minorities. To some people, it's controversial, but you know what's even more controversial? And I'm going to finish here. Mm -hmm. How long did it take to pass the anti-Asian hate bill? <laughs> Black people have been in America for 400 years. Ultimately, as Malcolm X said, and Malcolm X right behind me, as our hero Malcolm X said, the Black men and Black women, Black child in America, in the Americas, will not be respected as long as Africa will be weak. And Africa cannot and will not be respected as long as Black people worldwide are not respected. The reason the anti-Asian uh, hate bill went so fast is because the country called China is a strong country. It's strong economically. It has strong communities. Those white cops, and there was a study that proved it, a study in New York regarding the uh, frisk, uh, the police frisk, that was very clear in the recommendations to the white cops, they were not to go target the Chinese community. They were not to go target the Jewish communities. They target the black community because we are seen as weak. We are seen as weak socioeconomically. We are seen as weak in terms of identity. We divide ourselves in terms of party allegiances, white parties allegiances, white religions, et cetera, et cetera. And what, it, what does it do? We are not respected and we become easily victims by any means necessary. We must free ourselves. Allow me to stop here now. Elle, please go. Oh, I just wanted to very say quickly is yes, it's interesting that some communities who have uh, weaponized the model minority status that they're giving then want to adopt our models of social protest, like it's cool to have to protest. I'm not denying, obviously, the existence of anti-Asian racism because there's racism to all groups, but I find it really interesting how people, when we hit the streets, how nobody stands beside us and then our models of hitting the streets and protesting, it's like desirable. So then people are like, oh, my chance to protest. And like, that's interesting because where were you all these years when we've had to like protest for the basics of life? Um, and again, like 
the, I think there needs to be a reckoning with how model minority status contributes to anti-blackness. And so how many people have consciously distanced themselves from us repeatedly, right? Where we like, Affirmative action is bad for Asians. You know, we always hear that. So like this deliberate, like anti-blackness, like giving them access means that, you know, we can't have the access we deserve. You know, like they have those like schools in New York where they buy tests and like, um, you know, black people don't even get a look in at those schools and everyone's fine with that. But then, you know, all of a sudden, and I obviously, I guess I have to say here before somebody accuses me of something, like I have Chinese in my family, so I guess I can be black and Asian. So I guess I get to comment on this. I like, <laughs> like, you know, I don't know if we have to give our identities in order to make, you know, political commentary on this stuff. But no, I just find that interesting. And again, it goes back to the same thing I said that, you know, everybody want to use us, you know, when the time is right. Um, as Paul Mooney said, everyone want to be an N-word, no one want to be an N-word, right? And that's like the situation we're always in, right? So um, the minute we start even getting anything, it's interesting how then everybody has to be so angry that Black people are getting stuff. And what about this community? What about that community? Well, y'all fight for yourselves, you know? Like, mm -hmm. we, we've we been out here setting the model of all protests. We fight for everybody. Black women in particular carry everybody on our backs at all points. You know, we're not allowed to say or do anything unless we've, like, checked for everybody but ourselves. And then, yeah, people have the nerve to turn around and talk about how we're not supporting this movement and not supporting that movement as if people have ever supported black life, including many black people, as Cesar has pointed out. Like, we're still working on our own people because of internalized white supremacy and like what they put in the arts communities, like how they reward people like Candace Owen, who's making bank by doing this and was by all accounts a Democrat and then just like saw the opportunity financially to you know, like become the black Trump. And we know those rewards exist. So we still have to like encounter that. And then we're supposed to fight for every other community but ourselves too, right? Sarah, go ahead. Yeah, one thing I forgot to mention that really struck me was all those police officers who testified against Chauvin, you know, that whole blue wall thing. Uh, yeah, it crumbled for a minute, but that was a sweet minute mm. uh, to see, you know, uh, black current police chief saying, yeah, that's not how we do. That is wrong. Mm -hmm. And white ex-police chief saying, uh, no, that no, that's, that's not save them proper so. police conduct. Mm -hmm. And more of them just kept coming and other experts saying no. So I'm hoping that this is sort of a, this is a signal for the good cops that <sighs> If more of them would band together and, you know, be doing the right thing, maybe there might be a shift. And another thing that was not lost on me, while this trial was going on uh, of Derek Chauvin, a former uh, Black female police officer, she finally, like a, a Black police officer who did do the right thing. But in Buffalo. Where where, yes, in Buffalo, Coriel, I forget her last name, but her white male partner was roughing up this one guy that he was trying to arrest for whatever reason. And she got on top of him and, and pulled him off. He punched her, she got fired, and she was deprived of her retirement, of her pension yep. for 15 years. Yep. And only like during this trial, it That's came what, out. the story kind of got buried. So just the juxtaposition of all kinds of things, Breonna Taylor, Daniel Cameron, uh, Keith Ellison, Chauvin, Coriel in, in, in Buffalo, and then of course, Dante Wright getting assassinated yeah. around the same time. And I think yeah. it's like 64 people got killed during this trial, like black people. Yeah. Like yeah. it's a huge amount. So they kept going. And this is the thing is I, am I cynical reading as they were willing to throw Chauvin off under the bus to, you know, preserve the bigger system. Right. So then it's like, look, you, I mean, the same thing can happen in Ontario with, um, you know, Doug Ford passing, you know, these off <laughs> rules. And then they're like, even the cops are against it. You know, it's yes. like the cops yes. most terrible PR. It's not like cops are against stopping people. They're not stupid. An institution knows how to defend itself and preserve itself. Um, so Michael Brown, says this, the prison lawyer, right? That, uh, sorry, Cesar, I'll finish this early. Oh, no, please go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, finish. The crisis is part of the life of an institution and that institutions experience crisis and then they use that crisis to reform themselves and that is what extends their lifetime, right? Um, so on the other side, people always say to activists, like, don't waste a good crisis, right? That when there's a crisis, you have to sort of try and get in there and push things and try and push the crack because if you don't, the institution will reconstitute itself and claim 
that they learned from that crisis, you know, but what they're doing is preserving themselves. As we're saying that, and, uh, you know, Sarah making the connections between all these different events, Al, you talking in terms of the institution preserving itself. I'd like to give a big shout out to one of those, uh, I don't want to say unsung hero. I'm going to say it's important to say her name, but she's alive. She's not dead. A young 17 year old, Darnella Frazier, will be. Yes. She stood there bravely despite the cops, the four cops. And by four cops, the Asian cop who was being very threatening, basically keeping the gate for Chauvin to commit the murder with the two other cops assisting him, Darnella Frazier kept recording. Mm -hmm. Speaking about the blue wall of silence or whatever that blue wall of cops and blue lives matter, to what point would Chief uh, Darondoto, I believe his name, the black police chief, but also Lieutenant Zimmerman and some of these other cops and also other cops are traged in the nation and in Canada and worldwide. To what extent would they have been uh, outraged and would they have come to speak up against the practices of Derek Chauvin that dishonor the badge if that young 17 year old had not stood there to record it? If we did not live in an age of social media and technology as internet to air it. Let's not forget uh, Rodney King, 1992. I'm sorry, if a bunch of black people, black cops, were to beat like that a white person, I think we all know what would happen. There wouldn't even be a trial. You know, some of these internet uh, memes in terms of if the races were changed and that Derek Chauvin was a black cop, and George Floyd was a white man, would we even really have a trial? This is the same Minneapolis where the year prior, so yes. American black cop, Mohammed yeah. Noor, fearing for his life, shot at a white woman, rushing towards him in the middle of the night. You know, that excuse that we've heard so much from white cops getting scot free, he feared for his life. He got 12 years in jail, and the family also got compensated millions. That was justice. Are we really having justice or is this some type of appeasement? Because now in a few weeks, we get to have uh, the sentencing. Mm -hmm. He risks maximum of 40 years, but what is he really going to get? Mm -hmm. Let's not forget that our sister Sandra Bland somehow committed suicide, but we all know she did it. This is the same system that may sacrifice one of its own, aka Derek Chauvin. But if there was no Darnella Frazier to record it, mm -hmm. if there was no social media and internet to air it, and for people all the way to Japan and to Africa, to Brazil, to come on the streets in terms of tarnishing the U.S. image. I mean, the U.S. morality of giving lessons to Russia and China goes well. When the Russians and Chinese leaders are like, this is how you treat your black people. And it's not to say Russia and China are not racist. <laughs> you know what happened last year regarding COVID? Yeah, yeah. right. I froze on us. I, I was going to jump in. Interesting. During all this coverage, I think one of the most interesting comments I heard China, was... Uh, but let's face it. This is really, as Ben Crump and Al Sharpton said, I thought white supremacy was trying to cut off of, of the air. Uh, <laughs> as Ben Crump and Al Sharpton said, it's beyond George Floyd. It's beyond even Black Lives Matter. It's really the reconning, the questioning of America's soul beyond even America justice. A nation founded by colonialism, by racism, and that has deep patriarchal, homophobic issues, xenophobic issues, that nation is America. It's not just the land of the free because you need to make a check marks to define if you really are free. Uh, I'll jump back in. You froze for a minute, Cesar, and I talked over you, so my apologies. That one of the most interesting things I heard during the whole trial was there's an interview on NPR, and the interviewer asked one of the Black residents of Minneapolis, saying, what are you thinking about this trial? And he said, Black people in America, we get laws, but we don't get justice. And I think that was a very interesting comment that stuck out to me that I'm sure many bit black people, not only in America, but in this country, we get laws, but we don't get justice. 
Any final comments before we end our conversation? Go ahead, Sarah. Yeah, I'm wondering if, like, okay, so moving forward, because we saw how, we saw how in a case where you have a Black attorney general who's actually about civil rights, while applying the law that he's about civil rights. Because Keith Ellison, and you know, I remember when he was in Congress, like he's on the more progressive end of the Democratic uh, Party. Um, so it proves to me that a certain kind of representation matters, principled, ethical, you know, uh, and competent, because Ellison didn't just put together any old team, right? He put together a certain group of people who he knew could do that job. He was given a mandate by that governor and you know, he had the, uh, the legal and emotional intelligence to figure out, okay, this, is, this guy was playing chess, not checkers, mm -hmm. like the other side, right? So I'm wondering if an increase in the number of AGs with that kind of work ethic and competence. I and would, judges, that's another thing I'm hoping no, that if not. you color up the judicial system yeah. across that country with competent judges who actually are about justice. It's so there's the end. Okay. So this is where I'm going to maybe be a little bit of a disappointment for you. Just the previous president loaded up the judiciary system. With Republicans. Thank you. I know. So this is where the concern is going to be. And this is but, why the, yeah. the next set of elections, yeah. the midterms, yeah, it's going to be a real fight because, again, the the uh, the progressive state of Minnesota is not universal no, throughout the not. United States. And plus, look, here's another fact, and I don't want Americans to get mad at me, but there's still states in America where slavery is not, and uh, not slavery, hanging is not illegal. Yeah. yeah. So my concern but, is the judicial yeah. system yeah. is all over the place. Yeah. However, one thing that I'm really crossing my fingers, hoping and praying that uh, I think it's assistant attorney general or the, the person that Biden wants in charge of the civil rights division Merrick at Garland. the Justice Department. Is that Merrick I Garland? No, he's the attorney general of oh, the United he's, States. He's a big player too. No, no. I'm talking about the civil rights division, yeah. which deals with cases like this, you know, uh, police brutality cases and anti-black hate and white supremacy and that sort of thing. The Republicans are trying to not have her confirmed because they know what she's going to do once she gets in. Yeah. So yes, it's, it's, you know, this, it's disappointing that there aren't more. However, if right at the top, you have someone who is going to empower AGs like Ellison, et cetera, across the country. There's hope of I some agree. kind. I agree that there's hope, but also there's a time factor because yeah. once we blink a few times, there's another, there's the midterm election, then there's another presidential election. So some people are on the current president of the United States say, look, let's get going because <laughs> the time never lost a fight. Because again, let alone those fights aren't short fights, they're long fights. So just putting out there, any other final comments from our panel today? Al, do you want to go ahead or? I'm good. I think we've said everything. So. Yeah. And how can people get in contact with you, Ms. L. Jones, while well, you're in lockdown? Uh, um, people can always email me, l.el.jones -E at msvu, that's Mount St. Vincent University .ca. As always, my Facebook is kind of hard to get into. And that's it, though. But you can always email me or, yeah, catch me at all these events and things. Thank you so much. Continue to stay safe. Cesar. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to report some, uh, I put probably a white supremacist in the comments by the name of Paul Grimm and criticizing uh, uh, activist player LeBron James. Uh, Paul, you are 
I, I see you. I, 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 we, we have to call out the racists. We have to call out those that, beyond the difference of opinions, uh, try to always push back on any black advances. This is what always happened. Uh, one thing that I wanted to address, uh, Sarah Onyango, I, I agree 100% when she talked in terms of uh, representation. Uh, Pan-Africanism is not simply about having inclusivity of black people in the place, it's about what type of black people. And as such, remembering some of our leaders, uh, such as uh, Fred Hampton in the United States, but also Patrice Lumumba and so many others, it is not so much that our lives and our destinies are to be defined by white, Arab, etc., non-blacks, but it's for us to define them. And as such, in the black community, we need to keep elevating the identity, the racial pride, the ideology of our black children, youth, but also adults to dare to be black unapologetically. We saw it very well as Sarah was talking about Daniel Cameron and interest, uh, political interests in the MAGA movement. And we saw it so well with the defense, the prosecution, sorry, uh, in the direct Chauvin trial in which fact, science, the evidence that everybody sees was being addressed. That's basically what I will say. And I'm reachable, of course, uh, my Facebook, Cesar Rimi, R-I-M-Y. Uh, people can reach me there anytime. No problem. And finally, to our special guest of the day, but a special guest, special friend in our hearts, Sarah Iango. <laughs> and big uh, fan of the show. So this yes, is kind of, I'm geeking out support. here. Yes. Uh, yeah, you know, never mind the haters. There's always going to be, you know, the white supremacists and the haters who are going to uh, insult our athletes and thank God for them, you know, LeBron, our Toronto Raptors, et cetera, et cetera. More power to you. Keep doing what you do, Colin Kaepernick, because we need everybody, all hands on deck here. So I can be reached um, at the Black on Black Hotmail. Uh, it's uh, Black on Black 891 at hotmail.com. And like I said, you can hear our show every Saturday from 11 a.m. to noon at CHUO. 89.1 FM in Ottawa or online at chuo.fm. Thank you very much for inviting me. Honor and a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Well, it's Dr. Vibe here. I'm the host and producer of the award-winning Dr. Vibe show, the home of Epic Conversations. I'm the host of Epic Conversations 2020 Best Podcast News Award winner and 2018 Innovation Award winner given out by the Canadian Ethnic Media Association. Also, once a month, I host an online broadcast for fathers and dads. The only one in the world that is sponsored by Dove Men Care. It's also co-sponsored by Dad Central, Dad Central, Canada's National Fatherhood Organization. And I'm also the, kind of the board chair of the Global Food and Drink Initiative, whose goal is to showcase Blacks in the diaspora that are doing it in food, wine, and travel. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who watched live or on the replay. It's appreciated not taking for granted. Big also shout out to BIA Media. And as always, when I close out, I say, live your life as a dream. If you can dream it, you can make it. Sometimes you have to get smaller to get stronger. Block assumptions that aim bigger, aim better, aim higher, aim wider. Love, faith, and respect. And remember to give yourself grace. God bless. Peace well. Keep the faith. And take care, everyone.